Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on machine learning. So now I first have to get the slides. So here are the slides. Today we talk about model selection. And this is an omitted topic. So this is missing from my lecture so far. So the slides today are new. Many opportunities for you to spot the errors and the typos. Okay, there will be some in there, I'm sure. So the overview is twofold. There are two ways we are talking about it. We are talking about it more in a classical machine learning point of view. So we want to evaluate a test error, for example, using cross-validation. So I will explain that, how that works. And then I will talk about Bayesian model selection, okay, which is a different way to do model selection. And I also show you my attempts to implement some of this for linear regression. Let's first start with evaluating on test error, evaluating the test error is cross-validation. So let's look at this example of linear regression. And here to really talk about cross-validation, I don't know whether you looked it already up because it's one of the words that you didn't know and you looked it up, yeah, and you want to know. So it's always very hard to write it down. It's, it's kind of can get easily a mess. So let's try to have a good notation here. So um, there's a, suppose we have a data set, now I'm calling it D, okay, and the data set contains now these input-output pairs. And for simplicity, they are, should be all scalar valued. Yeah? Of course, it all applies to vector valued and to more general case, but this is the simplest one, and it keeps the formulas easy. And then, as you already know, by, with cross-validation or with training and testing and evaluation sets, you want to split the data set. That's why I want to have this single letter D for the data. And then I could say, now I split it into two parts or something. That's more useful than to say, now I have this capital X, which is like a matrix of rows. And then it gets a full, a complete mess kind of with the indexing or something. So this is just a new notation that is kind of tailored for the stuff I want to explain to you now. So the outputs are assumed to be noisy. So that's just a hint that there is basically, they are generated from some true model, okay? So there's a true weight, there's a polynomial, then I measure it, this polynomial at different locations, and then I add some noise, okay? My model now should be some, I want to have a, a linear regression model, but I also want to use this basis function here. So it should be a bit nonlinear. Why am I doing this? because I want to select the parameter D. So this is my model parameter. Or you could also view it if I have a linear function and I try to fit it to my data, that's one model. If I have a quadratic function, that's yet another model. If I have a cubic function, that's the third model. And I want to select among those. So it's like selecting this parameter D, okay? Which is also called a hyperparameter. Because what are the parameters? The parameter here is the W. So that is like the inner parameter of my function that I optimize. And then there's some outer parameter, which is like choosing one of the models, okay? So this is like a hierarchy of parameters. So we model the function just as a linear function in W, where we use these nonlinear features here. And of course, depending on the D, I will have a linear function or a constant function, even or a quadratic function or something more complicated. And the question is, how can I automatically choose the right one? Okay, so that is our goal. So let's introduce some more stuff. So we talked already about mean squared error, which is basically this difference between the true value of your function that you observed and then the one that your model is suggesting. Okay, and we square it up. And we calculate the average which is basically one divided by the number of data points I have in my data set, okay? And here I'm not using xi, I'm using more this notation, so this pair is inside this data set, okay? And this is the mean squared error, as we already seen it before. Before we were already, already motivating it with some assumption on the noise distribution here, so that it comes from the Gaussian that we could assume here for the noise, but this is something we don't care here so much about. Let's just accept we take the mean squared error. That's our goal. We can also plug in here this phi function. Again, this is just a redundant way to write the same stuff, okay? So I just want to make the following things clear. I put in here lots of parameters. So I put in the data, the weights, and the D as well as a variable. And then you could ask, so where is the D in this equation? And so it is, it is a parameter of my phi, okay? And um, I could have written f sub d, so to have it there as well, or I could also have written it f x comma w comma d. D is just yet another parameter, but it's on a different level, like, like there's a hierarchy of parameters. 
Okay, now my, uh, what I'm typically doing to find now my parameter w is I minimize the mean squared error, okay? And that corresponds to the maximum likelihood estimator as we know. But at this point we don't care. So we just say we have this wml which has as the input the data and this parameter little d and then basically we are minimizing this mean squared error function. So this is just a bit a more verbose way of writing stuff up that we've had already, okay? So now what is model selection is in this case, what is the best choice for D? Yeah, you could also say hyperparameter tuning. That's also model selection in a way. Of course, you could have a hyper hyperparameter, right? So you could have linear regression models. So that's one choice with different parameters of D. So there is the hyper hyperparameter to choose linear regression, the hyperparameter to choose the D. And another option for the hyper hyperparameter would be to be to use support vector regression or to use some other whatever boosted random forest tree, whatever you name it, regression. So there are many different methods. And of course model selection can also choose among those. So in a way, there's the parameter, in this case it's the W, then there's the hyperparameter, and then there's the choice of my method, which is just another parameter, okay? So in principle, I can select all of those automatically, but let's focus on these W and D in this case. So here's our first attempt to hyperparameter tuning. So here's the first suggestion. Just choose a D such that the mean squared error is minimized, okay? So just minimize the mean squared error on your data set, okay? And that's the best D. Actually, um, there's a problem with that one. This will overfit the data. It will just choose a very large D, okay? And then you really nicely are going through the noisy data with a super complicated polynomial. And actually at this point I should show you code. However, I didn't prepare that one, but let's see whether we can implement it quickly. So there is this notebook on model selection now, which looks very much like the regression one. It is a regression one with some added stuff. So let's go through it. So getting basically doing the same stuff as last time, having a function for the polynomials here, having um, the true function, right, which is quite nicely implemented. You get the x and the w, and the d is implicit in the length of the w. So depending on the length of the w, then you will choose more or fewer features, fine. Um, then we have a way to sample, and this sample thing is basically our data source. So this allows us for some true W to generate N data points where we have some noise on our data. Now you wonder, okay, noise standard deviation, that's another hyperparameter. And yes, you're right, that is another hyperparameter. In this case, I'm assuming it's fixed and I know it. So I could put it into the list of hyperparameters and try to choose it as well automatically, but in this case I don't. Okay, so I sample here some true data and now Later on, as you know, there's the whole data set and you split it into training and testing and maybe evaluation, you have heard it already. Um, the way I'm now handling this is when I need another test data set, I'm just sampling new data, okay? I'm just again applying the true W and generating more data. Good, then there's our linear regression formula. So there was a little change. I was using some wrong function here, LSDSQ, which was like kind of overkill. So the solve function is the right one that you should use at this point. The solve function is just solving a little equation with an inverse matrix, right? or maybe a linear equation. That's just what the solve function is doing. So, okay, I, I tell you. So suppose you are, want to calculate x equals inverse of a times, a, uh, times y. This is your goal with an add sign here. Then you could write x is equal to solve a comma y. So this is just doing the right thing. Why do you want to use the function? Why not use the inverse thing? The inverse thing is calculating too much. It's calculating using this big matrix and it might be numerically instable to do so. And it's easier to solve this as a set of linear equations with some other tricks iteratively. So that's why one uses, sometimes when you calculate an inverse matrix, you use this function solve instead, okay? So that's what I just did here. Okay, so this is the linear regression code. And now comes something new. So here I implemented the mean squared error and I hope I did it correctly. So I plug in the, the x into my function f, calculate the differences to the y, square everything up and take the mean, okay? The good thing about this implementation, so this x can be like a whole vector of data. So it can be 
many data points at once, and the Y is also having many data points at once. And so that's how this thing is calculating the mean. So basically it's calculating all the summons of the mean squared error and then calculating the mean of all these differences. Good, so far so good. So here comes our toy example. Um, okay, I have here already n tests, so that's something that I actually shouldn't use at this point. So I'm generating now some training data. I'm already using the words that we learn later in the lecture. Let's just say we are generating some data, okay? And it turns out this is a, we will later use it only as training data, but let's use it differently in the way we, I showed you here on the slide. So here we have this n train, this training data, and here basically the parameter is chosen in such a way that the mean squared error on the training data is optimal. And this looks like written down overly complicated, but it shows you that we are using the data set here twice. We're using it once for estimating the parameter w, and then we are using the data set to estimate the mean squared error. So let's see what's happening when we do this. Okay, so this again is this pretty plot. Um, this is already the code for attempt number two, so this is the second attempt, and I'm missing the first attempt, so let's have it in here. First attempt. So basically, um, I'm evaluating um, on the training set to choose D. So that's basically the thing that I want to do. And the code that I need here is, I just need the code, I can copy it from here, but I need to, I, I will go through it and explain it, what it is. So I will go through a whole range of possible values, D, and for each of these values, I will um, calculate the best W. So I do the parameter estimation, or when we are machine learning people, we say we are learning the parameter W, or we are training the parameter W. It's the same thing. And then I'm calculating the mean squared error on the training set, so using the same data set, and now using the estimated W, okay? And let's see what we get. So we get this nice list, and this is really small, so let's have a look at it. And what do we see? When we have a linear model, um, we have a fit. We can kind of go through the data, it's doing something. But as we increase the model complexity, the mean squared error is going down and down and down. And that's what we've seen in this picture here. If we increase the model complexity, like up to t, d being equal to 10, kind of we are almost going perfectly through the data here. Yeah, and we could try to overdo it. So let's try it with, I don't know, 18. Let's take that one. And that one will go even further perfectly through the data. And it's going now, everything is squashed because we have an 18th degree polynomial. And from where the data is not, it just goes super fast to infinity. So in between here, the new line should go nicely through the data point, even better than the d equals to 10. Yeah, but then left and right, it will just go wild. So that means if I would increase the range here, so let's increase the range up to 20, it should go even monotonically down, okay? And it's going down and down and down, okay? So the fit gets better and better and better. So first attempt failed because it would suggest, okay, d equals 19, that looks like a good choice, right? But we see that it's a very wiggly function that is not really capturing the structure in the data. Okay, so that was our first attempt to um, do model selection, and it failed. So we overfitted the data, okay? Um, so it would be nicer if we would have additional data that we haven't seen. So actually what we want to minimize is not the error on the training data, but we want to minimize the error on the unseen data, the new data that comes in tomorrow, okay? And this data is also called the test data. And where do we get this test data? So that is a problem. Um, luckily, in our script, we can just sample new data, okay? And then we have test data. However, um, a simple idea is to, to split the available data that you have into training and testing, or in this case, evaluation. Let's call it evaluation. So we just split our data sets that we have into seen data and into artificially unseen data, so that we put aside and we don't look at it for estimation of the W. Okay, so that is the second attempt. Now there's always a question, train, evaluation, test, and there's three, so why, where's the test one here? So the test one is reserved for the third attempt. 
Okay, so here we split um, the data into two parts. In one train, the training means I'm training on the D train to choose my parameter W, and then I'm evaluating on the D eval to choose my hyperparameter D. But in principle, there's no difference. I could have written train on the data for the parameters, okay, and then train on the data for the hyperparameters. And we could have a whole hierarchy. And then train on the parameter for the hyper hyperparameter, and then train on the parameter for the hyper hyperparameters. So we could split all these things. There could be a whole hierarchy of parameters that we could estimate. However, the simplest case is we just have parameters and hyperparameters. That's where you could al already make a mistake. Okay, now, great. So how do I do this exactly? Now, how do I choose my hyperparameter D? So we choose a D in such a way that the mean squared error on our evaluation set is small for the W that has been chosen on the training set. So now comes the notation um, why it's useful. So we can now distinguish between estimating the parameter here, W, using the training data, and then we are using the evaluation data yeah, for estimating the mean squared error. And by this kind of, we are splitting it. We are artificially creating unseen data for this step to select the best D. But again, as I say, you can put another hierarchy, another hierarchy, and above the whole thing. So you could iterate here arbitrarily. This is much better. It works quite well, okay? Here we don't have any overfitting while learning the parameter, which is good, okay? So let's look at the code. Oh, today it works really nice with the code. So here's the second attempt. So. I'm again now sampling new data. I didn't took the initial data set and split it into two parts. I just sample new data, right? I know how to generate data in this case. And then we estimate our W using linear regression using the training data. That's why it's X train and Y train for different values of D. And then we evaluate basically the outcome using our evaluation data, okay? If there is no test data, this could be also called the test data to estimate the test error. But there's another level that we want to do afterwards. Okay, so let's do this. And if I do the calculation here and we look at the numbers and you have good eyes, then you see that it's going down and then it's going up again. Okay, so basically these super duper polynomials of degree 10 or something, they were nice at the training data. But then came again some new data in, which is also following some simple curve, okay, and it's just scattered randomly around, and it has nothing to do with the other points before so much, okay? So that's why kind of now this is a way to find the right parameter. So we have our first model selection procedure, okay? So this is a way to select, select such a hyperparameter like the D, okay? So you need to split your data set into two parts, and then you estimate the parameter someone, and then you evaluate on the other, or if you like recursion, you train your hyperparameter then on the next data set. And then you could train your next hyper hyperparameter on the next data set, okay? That's basically it. But the inner part is always this estimation that then has to be done fully as well. Good, so far so good, so that's good. Um, there are still some problems here, okay? So afterwards, your boss comes and she wants to know, so great, how you learned something, you did a split, perfect, but how good is your method now? And maybe your first answer would be, yeah, my method here, look at this, it's if I choose the right parameter, okay, D equals four, the mean squared error is only 0 0.04232, okay? Isn't that great? And actually, unfortunately, this is a bit over-optimistic estimate of your true mean squared error. Why? Because here you overfitted the hyperparameter. So there's also overfitting to the hyperparameter. Okay? I will give another explanation for this effect. But kind of you are choosing the hyperparameter in such a way to minimize it optimally. And that doesn't mean that this will be for another set of random data than the mean squared error that we will observe. Okay? So, um, so the, just using this expression here, 
yeah, which was useful to get a good estimate of my hyperparameter, that might not be a good expression to estimate the mean squared error, okay? You see here now I plugged in the D2 in, inside here. So I'm estimated the D2 using this expression and then I plugged it in to estimate the mean squared error. And this is again a bit cheating. Um, so the question is still, so what is the real test error? Again, the test error is the error under unseen data. So what's the idea? Let's generate even more data, okay? So we generate yet another data set, and then we evaluate on that one. I show you first the code, and then I show you the slide. So this is the third attempt. So let's put it in here, third attempt. Calculate the test error for the best D. So this now tells me the best D in this case is four. Is it still four? No, now it's three. So it's kind of, it's still three, good. So now it's consistent. So how did I choose this? I now just looked at the number and took the smallest one. Of course, you can automate that, right? Finding the minimum, getting the index. It would take me half an hour to work it out in Python. And so I didn't do it. I do it by hand. But it's easy to do. If you have a list of number, you can get the index of the smallest one. So here's the third attempt. Let's generate even more data. So here's the test set now. And we train again on our um, training data set and we are using our D-best. So now I plugged in, again, the training set, data set, but I also plugged in the hyperparameter, which I identified in my second attempt. And this is now my answer. This is my W, which I want to use. And now for evaluation, I'm using the third kind of data that I have. I'm using the test data to calculate the mean squared error. Let's do that and let's compare the numbers. And as you can see, it's even lower. So that's surprising. So that looks like a bug. Hmm, it should be a little bit larger. Actually, it, is there a bug in here? Okay, very bad. So it should be a little bit larger. So let me run it again. So there's always some randomness in here. Maybe I shouldn't use so much data. Then it, this is too precise. Okay, so now I have that one. Okay, D equals four. So let's take that one. I again, D equals three. I'm making it up, you see. But it's not, I'm not cheating. Again, it's smaller. Okay, this sounds like a bug. So there must be a bug. But I, I hope you got the story. So that um, that's how you do it. I have no idea why this is not, not doing the right thing here. It should do the right thing. Maybe, but I'm, I mean, I'm doing the mean squared error. So it shouldn't matter. But let's do this. Let's, let's keep it all at 100. So maybe that's better. So also my training data, oh, my training data was small anyway, so that's okay. Okay, so um, that was, so let's do this one. Okay, great, it's D equals three. Okay, now it worked, great, perfect. Yeah, maybe, maybe you were right, maybe it was about the number of training points. So this shouldn't be a surprise if it's larger, and it should be a surprise if it's smaller, but it's just uh, it's small examples. And then that's why there are things could go up and down kind of randomly. However, the, the true mean squared error is a little bit larger. And to understand that, I can also give you an example which might not be related on first sight, but it's quite similar. So it is about estimating the variance of a Gaussian distribution, okay? And maybe if the quick people among you, variance is something like the expectation of the square distance to the mean, which is like a least square problem, right? It's the same thing. So the variance is minimizing a least square problem. And um, there the thing is, yeah, it's working. So suppose you have a 2D data set, which is coming from a Gaussian distribution, okay? So those are your samples from your data set. And now you're interested in estimating the mean, okay, which is just um, one divided by n xi, okay? And then you're estimating the variance. Now it becomes a bit funny because I'm looking at the square distance to, to what? To my sample mean. That is the problem here. So let's put a hat on top of it. So that's how statisticians often say that is an estimate, okay? So I'm using the estimated mean here and calculating the square distance and average over that one. And then there's the discussion of having n or n minus one. That's another story for people who, who like to look it up, whether it's unbiased or not. Now, what's special about it? 
these, this sigma squared here is also overly optimistic of the distance that we actually have. Why? Because this mu hat was optimized in such a way to be exactly the point that has the smallest distances from everyone. So if you would take the derivative of this one with respect to mu and set it to 0, you get exactly this formula here. So you get exactly the estimator. So this estimator is minimizing the variance, your sample variance. Okay, So that is the best thing. However, would you really believe that the true mean is over here from five data points? Of course not. The true mean might be next to it, close by, but next to it. It's not the exact one. However, this sample mean here, or this um, estimated mean, that's the one that is minimizing this expression. So that is the one that gives you the smallest variance. So it means if you take the sample mean and plug it into this formula, you are underestimating your um, variance here. By the way, for that reason, people put an n minus 1 here. And I think then it's fine. I think then again it's an unbiased estimate. But I'm not super sure about it. I'm not a statistician. Anyway, let's keep it like that. So what I'm saying is, so the estimate here is chosen in such a way to be the best choice for minimizing the square dis distances. Okay. So since I'm sure it's not the true one, yeah, the other one will have a slightly larger average square distance. So that means that this estimate here is underestimating the true variance. That is exactly the same behavior that we've seen here in the code. Okay. Here we are also we choosing we have chosen the the minimizer of the mean squared error yeah for our parameter w and for the d okay and by this kind of we are underestimating the true mean uh, the true variance that there is and by the variance in this case is the mean squared error so also in this case kind of we are um, making a small mistake. So that's why there's this third attempt. And I showed you already the code, but we can also write it down. So we split our data set into three disjoint subsets, train, eval, and test. And the names are kind of random, right? From the perspective of the hyperparameter is our d eval data set is a d test set, right? We are interested in some error on some unseen data that hasn't been used for training. So they are more historic that one is called training, evaluation, and testing. It also only, those are only enough names if you only have parameters and hyperparameters. If you have hyper hyperparameters and hyper hyper hyperparameters, you would need more names for these sets because you need more of them. Okay? So the three steps we train on the train data, and this is estimating our parameter. And then we evaluate on the de evaluation data, or you could also say we train on the evaluation data to find our hyperparameter. And then finally, we are not, again, at the, at the end, we are not trying to um, uh, find a new parameter or something. At the end, basically, we want to evaluate the loss function or this, the mean squared error. And that is then done on yet another data set. Okay? So um, I think this is kind of bogus. I'm not sure about the middle one here. I think that should, should be taken out because I'm, I'm not. Um, no, no, this is, this is wrong. This is some copy and paste. So here's something wrong on the slide. So ignore the middle part. So on this slide here for the hyperparameter tuning, my third attempt is doing the same as the second attempt. But additionally, I want to calculate the mean squared error. OK, so that is the whole point of this slide. So please ignore the middle part, unless I tell you next time not to do. But I think I I'm, I'm forgot to remove it here from the slide. So the key here is, that at the end, we can calculate the test error on yet another data set. OK, so those are these three steps. This is why you split your data into training, evaluation, and testing. This is also considered kind of the gold standard, right? So this is the best you can do, because um, if you have enough data, yeah, like sometimes in neural networks or sometimes, then data is abundant, so you have arbitrary lots of data, then it's easy to calculate some meaningful test statistics at the end. Okay? And by always separating the different data sets for the parameters, for the hyperparameters, and for the estimation of the error at the end, we have no overfitting of the parameter, and we have no overfitting of the hyperparameter. Okay? 
So far, so good. So this is great. Um, there are some more thoughts about it. You might wonder now, why does cross-validation come into play? Right, so we haven't talked about cross validation. This was just about splitting data set and estimating parameters on different levels. So there are some problems left. Somehow it looks wasteful, right? So you have your data set D, and it might have been super expensive to collect. And now it's kind of weird to waste data to estimate the mean squared error at the end, right? So I actually wouldn't it be better to estimate my W on all the data, right, instead of only estimating it on half of the data and reserving the rest? By the way, how do you split your data set anyway? Should it be one-third, 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 or should it be 75%, 12.5%, 12.5%? Um, I'm not sure whether anyone can answer that, so that's more like fiddling around and trying, so there's no easy answer to that one. But it's kind of frustrating that we are not using all our data for estimating the parameters, and we are also not using all our data for estimating the hyperparameters. And for this, there's a solution, or let me better call it a hack, because it's not like the complete solution, but it's improving our estimation. Okay? It's not solving it completely, but it's improving it. So it's making it better, and that is cross-validation. Let's first look at two-fold cross-validation, which is like a simple Simple case. First of all, let's have a, an easier setup here without hyperparameters, because this is not about this hierarchy of parameters. This is about splitting the data set once into s data that you are allowed to use and into unseen data. Okay, it's only about this split now that we are talking about here. The hyperparameter thing is another dimension if you want to view it like this. So we are given some data and we have a model with some parameter W, okay, but we have no hyperparameters here. Our goal is to estimate the test error at the end. So how do we do it? In cross-validation, we split our data set into two sets, D1 and D2, and then we train our W1 on D1, and we estimate the mean squared error, let's call it epsilon 1, yeah, on the other data set for the estimated W1. And then we do the same thing again. We know everything we learned about W, and we learn a new W2 on the other data set, and estimate the mean squared error, epsilon 2, on the first data set, okay, using our new W2. And then finally, the cross-validation estimate of the test error is in the average of those two mistakes, okay? And that's typically better than to just ignore half of the data for the estimation and not keep the other one. Why is that might be a good idea? So suppose maybe in the first half, there are some really difficult examples, okay, and they are super noisy and very hard to estimate. So this will lead to a very large mean squared error because the data is so noisy. So we cannot do better. Yeah? However, in the other half of the data set, there might be more simpler example. And so depending on, on which side I'm training, I'm over or underestimating the true mean squared error that I can achieve. Okay? And by averaging it, basically, um, yeah, kind of we are distributing our luck, kind of. Okay? By the way, for that reason, you should also always, when I say split the data into several sets, you should always do it randomly. Yeah? Never ever do it that you take the first 100 indices in one and then the other 100 in the other one. Maybe your data set was sorted and the first 100 one is class one and the second 100 one is class two. You never know. You, in Python, how you would do it, you would typically take a random permutation of the right length and then you index into the random permutation, and then you use those indices to select randomly from a data set. Or you use sklearn, okay? So that's another. There are some functions for that one, too. Okay, so that's a way to do cross-validation estimate. By the way, this is, again, a side note, yeah? Here's another word that you might not know, ensemble methods, but you heard about it. Ensemble methods are the methods that win these Kaggle changes, challenges. So those are the methods which are mostly taking many different methods, and then they average the result at the end. That is an ensemble method. So you take an ensemble of different approaches. Suppose you have a regression problem, then you train linear regression, you train a support vector regression, you train a neural network, and at the end you average the result, and that is your ensemble method. And those methods are typically better than all other methods. Okay? This is at first quite surprising because shouldn't be, you be a bit proud, a proud deep learning person and say my deep learning thing is the best thing out there, so it should beat everyone else. 
No, it looks like taking the average of many different approaches is much better than to stick with one approach. Basically, this is an, is an instance of an ensemble estimate, right? So I'm taking an ensemble where the ensemble is here generated by splitting the data set. Okay, so that's kind of related. Question? Yeah, good question. Very valid question. What is the final answer, right? So what model should I use? Um, good question. I'm, I'm always confused with it. I don't know. I, I probably would maybe use the W1. Maybe I would average the W1 and W2, but this could be total bogus for neural networks, right? So it could be completely wrong. I think uh, you can use one of them. The problem is, if you now say, OK, now great, I did cross-validation. So now at the very end, I take all the data and estimate a nice W. Then again, you did overfitting, possibly, right? So that's exactly what you wanted to avoid. So that's like a dilemma. I think you can take one of them. Probably the most fair would be to pick a random one. I'm not sure. But it's a valid question that comes up when you do it in practice. Yeah. Um, of course. Only having two data sets is a bit wasteful. Maybe it's better to split it into more parts. And this is called k-fold cross-validation. Okay? So if I take k-folds, so I have now k subsets. And um, now the algorithm is like this. So basically, at the end, I'm taking an average over k estimates. How do I get one estimate? I'm basically picking one of them, and that one plays the role of the test set, excuse me, or the evaluation set, whatever you like to name it. And then you train your parameter on all the others. And this is leveraging a little bit what you were saying, right? So here I might, in tenfold cross validation, my final W has been trained on 90% of the data, which is an obviously better than just to train it on half of the data. There's an extreme case I could choose k being equal to the number of data sets. And this is called the leave one out cross validation. Leave one out, so you leave one out. That is the one that you use for testing. It sounds weird when you first hear it. It's like you have a classification problem with 1,000 classes, and your first test set is the cat image. Okay, fine. You train on all the data, and then you test on the single cat image. Then you do it again. You again take another image out. It might be another cat image, and so on and so forth. However, at the end, you will have an average over all these results, and then it's a good estimate. So the leave one out thing is another way to do it. However, I, th I don't know it well enough, but uh, maybe you can look it up. Get another thing to look up. Um, that whether the leave one out thing is always better than the other one, it's just too expensive, right? I mean, how expensive is it? Instead of running once over the training set, you run n times over the training set, which is super expensive, of course, right? So I'm not sure whether the leave one out thing is, can be proven to be always better than the other estimates. I doubt it, actually. I doubt it. But I'm not sure. Good, so this is the leave one out cross-validation. Um, now let's go back to our initial setup where we had a parameter and a hyperparameter. That's like a super typical setup, right? We haven't talked about support vector classification, but there are also some magic numbers that you need to tweak, right? Or regularization constants, those are the coefficients in front of the regularization term. Those are typically hyperparameters, right? Which are not directly optimized, but which are kind of set in an outer loop. So um, now in principle, we should nest the cross-validation if we want to apply it for the parameter and hyperparameter. So it gets a mess to write down. So here's my attempt to write it down, OK? So the goal, is again, is to estimate the test error. So I have an outer loop of k-fold cross-validation, which is that one here that's just almost copied from the other one. Now, inside my choice of having a particular split, um, I'm basically now taking the, the data set and splitting it accordingly to my variable i here. So I have the 90% of the data and some 10% of the data, for example. And then I train my w and my d on this one, on the 90% of the data. And the next two steps I omit. And then I estimate it on the test set. Now, what are these steps that are omitted? This is now yet another k-fold cross-validation. However, now I'm not using it to estimate the final test error. 
but I using the innermost k prime cross validation to estimate the test errors for the choice of my hyperparameters. Yeah, as you remember, my hyperparameter is chosen in my second attempt slide here in such a way um, that on an evaluation set, basically, it is very good. And of course, also this means squared error here. I could estimate with a k-fold cross-validation attempt, right? So um, I could dynamically split this evaluation set and always pick another one and not just do it once, but iterate over all possible choices here and have a better estimate of my mean squared error to have then also a better choice of my hyperparameter. Okay, so this basically this, um, where do we have it? So basically the steps train the W and the D on this subset can be now also done using an inner loop k-fold cross-validation because the k-fold cross-validation gives me a better estimate of the mean squared error that I'm then using for the choice of my hyperparameter, okay? However, if you try to write it down, it's getting really ugly. So the notation with the Ds, you need double indices and you need set minus and some other weird things. So I wasn't able to do it, so that's why I wrote it like this. So you use the inner k-fold cross-validation to estimate the mean squared error for the hyperparameter choice. That is the point of the k-fold cross-validation. Of course, now, if you're a good programmer in Python, you can write a function, k-fold cross-validation, which gets a data set and which gets some other information, maybe some function function it could be, and then it does it. And then you just call inside this cross-validation function the other cross-validation function itself. So implementation-wise, you can do it. Of course, if you have like nested loops, you see that the whole thing explodes. So you could ask, so how often for this procedure, for the nested cross-validation, how often do I have to train a W? And actually there it turns out you have to do it k times k prime times. So the outer loop cross-validation says you have to do the inner thing k times, and the inner thing, the k prime fold cross-validation means, to estimate the mean squared error using cross-validation for the model selection, inner model selection, you need to calculate a w for every, um, for every choice of subset in the inner loop. So it gets really expensive, okay? So before maybe you do, you're saying now, okay, I have a cluster of 10 GPUs, I now do 10-fold trust validation, I can run it in parallel, that's great. But then when you do it gold standard style nested cross validation for your hyperparameter choice, then suddenly you have 10 times 10, the running time, okay? And kind of what you gained by your GPU cluster is gone already. Good, so this is the ideal thing, yeah? Which should be the best estimate. And this should, try to, this should help you avoid overfitting and do these things. In practice, I think often it's, first of all, very important to be aware of these things that there are some issues there with the estimation and that you might be overly optimistic with your estimation of the mean squared error. And then to see in your setup what actions to take, right? Whether you can afford to do a nested cross-validation or not. Good, so far so good. So this is like the, I would call it classical machine learning way of um, doing things to estimate basically the test error and to set parameters and hyperparameters like in a, in a meaningful fashion. Okay, let's see, where are we? Um, let's move on to Bayesian model selection, okay? And this is now a different approach, but since we are also partly Bayesian or Bayesian by heart, I don't know, let's look at the Bayesian model selection. Of course, this will be the definite answer. This is the most pretty thing to do, however, completely infeasible. And we will see in our code that you get logarithm and inverse matrices and it's not nice, and it's very weird to do gradient descent there with a fixed learning rate, and so it's very strange. Let's look at it. First of all, let's talk about Bayesian inference. And also here now will come the stuff with parameter and hyperparameter and all these things, but now written down in a Bayesian fashion. So Bayesian inference, so for example, in linear regression, we have a prior for our parameter W. Then we have a likelihood which tells us how the data was generated given our parameter. And here is no hyperparameter, okay? So this is really saying I'm fitting a quadratic function. D is constant, equal to, or D is equal to one, I'm fitting a linear function. Then the inference given data is just applying Bayes' rule, 
And there are some things that I can calculate. I can calculate this bottom part here, that is the so-called evidence, for example. Um, the posterior now tells us how the prior and the likelihood are combined. And they are combined via product rule or base rule. They're just multiplied with each other, right? So the prior is something good to say about w, where something good means there are some numbers large and some numbers small. And then the likelihood, given the data, is something to say about the w. So it says, oh, OK, if that is my data, then those w's are root out. They get small numbers. And this gets pointwise multiplied right here, OK? So it, it describes what parameters are still likely after seeing the data. And then there's the evidence. And the evidence kind of is integrating out the parameter. So the evidence, of course, depends on the model choice. So we are saying it should be a linear function, OK? But we are not estimating a parameter here. We are integrating out all possibilities. And then basically it says, how likely is it to see the data given that I have a certain model, but without estimating the w? I don't care for the w. I just want, I'm just wondering whether it is kind of a linear model or not. This gives us already a hint how we could do Bayesian model selection, right? We write down the whole thing for d equals 1 for a linear equation, and then we write down the whole thing for d equals 2. And both give us an expression for the evidence at the end. And then we could say, ah, we just, l we just pick the d such that the evidence is maximized. Okay, And that is Bayesian model selection. That's it. Why is it super cool? Because we are using all the data for the estimation, and we are using all the data for the model selection. So we are not splitting anything here. We're just having some clever math going on. And as long as you can do the integrations here, yeah, you can do it. right? And as long if, as you trust your priors. And if the priors are garbage, garbage in, garbage out. right? Then if your prior says there are some zeros, then there will be zero forever, because you are multiplying here. So if you know these things and you trust them, you gain a lot. You can make use of all the data suddenly, okay? which is very surprising and interesting. OK, let's introduce hyperparameters now. So this is now my hyperparameter. And the theta collects numbers like the d, the letter d, right? the, um, uh, the degree of my polynomials. That could be in the theta. But of course, I can plug everything in the theta. I can also plug in the noise variance like the sigma square or the tau square of a linear regression model. So it can be anything. However, of, for those, of course, since I'm Bayesian, I now need a hyper prior, right? I, I need some whatever gamma prior, some conjugate, super cleverly chosen thing that kind of makes sense for parameters which are always positive. OK? I need a hyper prior. And I didn't write it down because I'm not following this route so explicitly here. So I'm not really giving you an example for that one. But let's go through the math. On level 1, where level 1 is now about our parameters, and level 2 will be about our hyperparameters, on level 1, we can do inference. And that's basically the same stuff that I just wrote down, everything conditioned on theta, okay? because it's all conditioned on theta now. Um, level 2 will be the inference of the hyperparameters. And if we are fully Bayesian, that would be the right way to do it. right? We would write down now the hyperposterior distribution, which is again base rule. Yeah, it's p of theta given the data. So I don't care for the particular parameter choice w. I integrate that one out. So that's something I don't care. I'm interested in the hyperparameter here. That's why we get that one. But as you can see, down here we have the p of d, right? so the evidence. And that is the one that's integrating out basically everything, even the hyperparameters over my priors. And um, that's something also very hard to, uh, to get. However, of course, maybe we can maximize the hyperposterior. And since we want to maximize it in terms of theta, we don't care for the p of d. Okay? So we only maximize the top part. So let's look at the top part. Okay, the p of theta was something we can choose. But then we have the p of d given theta. And that is also an integral beast here. It's also one of these, the evidence from the level above. And that's another integration we cannot do typically, which is too hard. Okay, So in principle, this is the right Bayesian way. And being fully Bayesian, we would say, uh, we are not interested in point estimates for our hyperparameters. We want posteriors for our hyperparameters, because at the end, we integrate out everything. Okay, And maybe in 100 years, people are doing it. If the mass proceeds, and we get a nice calculus for integration, or we have nice computer programming languages which can do all these integrals automatically. 
There are people implementing something like that. There are numerical methods for this integration. So there are ways to do all these integrals. And one area is called probabilistic programming, and a related area is Markov chain Monte Carlo. So that is like a way to do all these integrals. The reason why MCMC is such a big field is because this is the answer to all questions, these formulas here. However, we cannot compute them. So if we can approximate them, that should be useful. Okay? So the MCMC people are typically trying to evaluate these integrals here. Good, let's introduce um, another hyper-hyper-parameter. Okay? The hyper-hyper-parameter is often called a model. Yeah? So we could have a model prior. Why the distinction? Yeah, sometimes like the model prior is a discrete variable maybe, right? It might be a linear regression or a support vector regression or something else regression. And so you would condition on that one now everywhere here. And you might have also a prior on that one. Typically your prior might be, yeah, I'm a neural networks person. It always works. However, maybe the support vector guys sometimes win. So I include them here, but my prior for them is low. So I could quantify that if I have experiences with these methods, okay? Good, I mean, then there's level one, two, three, inference of parameters, hyperparameters, and models given data. So this is fully Bayesian inference going through all levels, and you can extend it in indefinitely. However, the integration, you, in every level you get another integral there, which you cannot solve typically, okay? So that is basically the right way to do things, if you could compute it. Good, so far so good. Um, let me see. So if we do inference, okay, I wrote it out. I'm not going through all the detail. You can look at for your pleasure at these formulas. I hope there's no mistake. But basically, those are now the inference of the different parameters. So I wrote down the posterior for the parameter, the hyper posterior, and the model posterior. And it's all following a pattern, of course, right? But um, yeah, I'm not sure whether one can really practically do these integrations. Let's look at an example. So this is like the ideal world, how we should do it if we could do the integration, right? Let's look at an example. Let's look at the regression example. Um, there, first of all, one thing about notation. Um, instead of having a model for p of d, p of the data, in regression we model p of y given x. The weird thing here is just the x is not random. The x is given. The locations are fixed in regression problems, right? We typically assume that the y is something random here that we model. So we model the distribution of the outputs given the inputs. And that's enough, OK? So if we write it out, then we would have a model specification like that. So we have the model prior, hyper prior, some prior on the parameters. By the way, this w could be another mean of a Gaussian distribution, or it could be the variance of a Gaussian distribution for the w, or something else, OK? And then finally, we have the likelihood. And now this is the part that's different from the previous slide. On the previous slide, it was all p of d given w and h. And now we have p of y given x. So there's now an additional x on the other side. So when we write out the, the level 1, 2, 3 inference of parameters, then we have all these expressions. And again, I just wrote them out for fun to have them here, right? Those, uh, there won't be a question in the exam. Please write down the hyperposterior for linear regression, right? That is not an exam question. But in principle, um, one can write it down, and it looks then like that. So let's start with level one. So we learned already that in level one, there is, uh, if we assume a prior distribution for the w, let's say we make it concrete, and we say it's a Gaussian distribution with mean zero. Yeah, so it's this zero sub d. It's these zeros of d expression in, in Python, and uh, um, identity matrix of size d, where we have tau squared on the diagonal, so the variance of each variable here is tau squared. Um, then we have the likelihood, so the observation, given the data, is basically a Gaussian distribution around this true x times w, okay, with some covariance fun a matrix again, which is again a diagonal matrix. Then we can infer the following posterior. So basically, it's also Gaussian distribution with some particular mean and the particular covariance. And those are just the formulas from the previous lectures. And they didn't get nicer, but they also didn't change. They didn't get worse. So they are still the same thing. I instantiated them here for this particular choice. 
I think on the slides, I wrote down the general version with the W0 and with some V0 over here, so with some more complex things. So this is like a little simplification of it. Um, <coughs> on this slide, sigma squared and tau squared are assumed to be known. Actually, those are hyperparameters, right? Those are parameters that are on another level above the whole thing. So if they are assumed to be known, we can do all this, and everything is Gaussian. Um, however, now let's add our uh, let's add more random variables for these hyperparameters, okay? Since we want to do model selection, Bayesian model selection, here now it means I want to estimate sigma squared and tau squared. I could also include the d, but I didn't, because the d is a discrete variable in this case. So let's write it down. We need a hyperprior for our theta, and then now we condition now our w on the theta. So now the entries of the theta are basically, in this case, Okay, I included it sigma squared, tau squared, and d, and that's a vector that collects all hyperparameters. And um, in principle now, we can infer the posterior, where the posterior is also now conditioned on this choice. So nothing changes. It's also the same distribution as before. Um, now for level two, what can we do? Um, for this, we typically need the evidence from level one, right? So let's flip back a little bit. So. For the level two, we need this expression down here, which is the evidence yeah, from level one, which was, where was the other slide? Uh, over here. Is it here? No. There. So this is basically the evidence from level one, the P of D. No, that's not right. So that was the simpler one. So where's the, yeah, here is the evidence. So this is the evidence. That is the evidence of level one. That is where I'm integrating out the parameter. And that thing is used now for the level two hyper, um, hyper posterior, okay? And I need to plug it in here. Okay, so let's see what's happening in the linear regression case. So we need this expression where now I'm writing not P of D given theta, but I'm having this P of Y given X since I'm talking about regression. And this thing here is also, um, the, the first entry is a Gaussian distribution, the second entry is a Gaussian distribution, as it turns out, the whole thing can be derived as a Gaussian distribution, okay? So not only the posterior on the first level is a Gaussian distribution, but also the evidence can be written as a Gaussian distribution, which is good. And this thing gets a name. This thing is called marginal likelihood. Here again, it's a random combination of words. Marginal typically means like Randverteilung in German or integrating out some variables from a joint distribution. And which variable did we integrate out? We integrated out the parameter. So the marginal is referring to integrating out the parameter w, okay? And then likelihood, yeah, it's telling us how likely is the data that we see it. So it looks a bit like this thing up here where we integrated out basically the w, okay? Good, now in order to infer the hyperposterior now, um, Unfortunately, the whole thing gets quickly too complicated. So this thing might be a Gaussian distribution still. The P of theta is no longer anything nice, and the thing down here is something that you typically cannot compute anymore. So this is where, in practice, things stop, okay? However, we can use some of it. And what people are typically doing is, instead of being fully Bayesian through all hierarchies, they say, we are a little bit Bayesian and we stop right here. We stop at the marginal likelihood and instead of um, um, the trying to maximize the hyperposterior, what we are doing now, we are maximizing the marginal likelihood. And so this is like saying on level one, I'm Bayesian, I'm doing everything with base rule, and on level two, I'm now doing maximum likelihood, okay? because the marginal likelihood is really the same as the likelihood in the upper levels, but the one where I'm integrated out the W. So for that reason, this is also often called type two maximum likelihood. Type two because I'm partly Bayesian and then I'm doing maximum likelihood. It's also called empirical base. It's also called generalized maximum likelihood or sometimes also evidence approximation. I got all this from the nice book from Chris Bishop and there's section three, and there you can read basically many more details with a slightly different notation, okay?
Good, so let's derive our um, marginal likelihood. And let's first look at, so where are we starting? We're starting at the logarithm of this guy. And where do we end? We end at the logarithm of a Gaussian distribution. And then something in between happens, OK? So this is the derivation that shows that, that, that this um, marginal likelihood is a Gaussian distribution, OK? That's what this derivation will show you. And then once you understand that this is a Gaussian distribution, you can just plug in the expression, which is like 1 divided by 2 pi something, determinant, and so on, e to the something. However, then we apply the logarithm, and then the product of our density kind of turns into these nice summons here, OK? Where you hopefully recognize all terms. So this is the um, logarithm of the determinant of the covariance matrix. Here's the covariance matrix that is the cover covariance matrix. And actually, it's the square root of the covariance matrix. But when you take the logarithm of it, right, then you can drag out the a half from the square root in front. Then what about the minus sign? Ah, oh, yeah, it was the 1 divided by the logarithm of the determinant. And the 1 divided by turns into a minus sign for the logarithm. Similarly, here for the 2 pi, and similarly for the last term here. So this is just the mean is 0, so it's y minus 0. And then comes the inverse covariance matrix, and again, y minus 0. So that's where this expression comes from. Um, now, what about the steps in between? Let's look at them. So I'm just plugging in the definition of my marginal likelihood. Then I'm plugging in the Gaussian distributions that I'm assumed for these expressions here. And then I'm using some magic trick, OK? So there is a transformation formula that transforms this product into that one. And it's a variation of the product rule. For your pleasure, I copied it here. So this is a formula that you need to use. So basically, suppose you have an expression for the Gaussian distribution of x and for the conditional distribution of y given x, where the x appears here on the right-hand side. So it's really conditioned on x. Then you could also rewrite it the other way around and have a Gaussian distribution without an x in here. However, then you will have an x given y, and the y appears in the distribution for the x. So this is just a variation of the product rule, as we've seen it in the other lecture. This is copied from page 93 from the Bishop book, these formulas here. When you do this, you not even have to do the full thing here. You just need to do it for the first one. You get an expression for the y that does not depend on the w, and you get an expression for the w that does not depend on the y at the end. Okay? Why is it good? Because then I can just drag out this thing out of the integration, since it's constant with respect to w, and I have the integration over some PDF, which is equal to 1. Okay? And it's gone. Okay? So that's how to derive a result like that. You start with two Gaussians. You want to integrate something out. You need to find the right trick. And then you integrate one of the Gaussians, and it's fine. Then the integration is gone, and everything is good. Good, so far so good. Um, so, oh yeah, this was the formula. So now, setting the hyperparameters for linear regression in a Bayesian model selection way, how do you do it? You take the logarithm of the marginal likelihood, which is this expression now, and you view it as a function of the hyperparameter theta. And now you're just doing maximum marginal likelihood. You maximize this marginal likelihood with respect to the hyperparameters. And you can just do this, for example, using gradient descent. Okay? And now I'm saying, it. yeah, you just do it. And I tried it, and it's horrible. Why is it horrible? Because this is logarithm of a determinant, and there are some inverse matrices, and it's very unstable, and it looks very bad. But I show you some plots. In principle, for looking at the plots, you will say, yes, there is a local optima that could be found if one does the right optimization. OK, um, so where does the sigma squared and the tau square appear? So it, they appear under the log determinant here, and they appear back here in this inverse matrix. And those are the two parameters I want to optimize. Can we use matrix differential calculus? Of course. So since we learned it last time, I thought, now let's try it. And it took only a couple of hours for the derivation. No, actually, it was quite fast. So this is now saying, OK, let's calculate the, the derivative of it. We want to use gradient descent. So let's calculate the derivative of this guy with respect to sigma squared and tau squared. And the good thing is, let's give the matrix A, uh, this uh, covariance matrix, a particular name, and write everything down. 
and then you just follow the rules and suddenly you will have this d log dead a and there was this particular formula for that one which is just a trace of the inverse matrix times da and here's another one the da inverse that was this weird formula the a inverse times da times a inverse and you plug everything in and you can really derive it now we derived it with respect to the a then you plug in for the a the expression and you can kind of read off with a little bit of playing around the derivative with respect to sigma squared and tau squared. And this is a derivative you cannot do with the typical partial way of indicing thing. I think this can be only done with matrix differential calculus. Okay, we can use it for gradient descent, and I show you my attempts to do that. Um, so let's have a look at the code. Where is it? Zero. Okay, here comes the Bayesian linear regression code again. So it's basically the same stuff as last time. And maybe I should execute it once more. Um, so there's a prior for W, and then there's a posterior for W, and I think we don't need it anymore, because if you look at it, if you look at the slide, um, here is no W in here, right? We are not really estimating the W. Kind of, we are taking we are already abstracted away the w, it's integrated out. We don't care for estimating a particular w here. We just found some fancy formula that will do the right thing, ideally, hopefully. So let's see whether it really does the right thing. So first of all, we need to implement the um, log marginal likelihood. So this is the implementation. I also give the a name here, so that's very good to do this. Then I like to write things first down, how it almost looks like the formulas, and then I replace the inverse a times something by a solve a comma y. That's numerically better to do it like that. And finally, I give it a short name, since I'm always talking about the same training and test set, so I should do it like that. I can then use the, fu the function LML in some optimizer or something. So this is defining the log marginal likelihood. So, Let's calculate the log marginal likelihood on a grid, okay? Then we can have, let's visualize it. Let's see how it looks. So this is how it looks. So one axis is sigma, the other one is tau. And this doesn't look like it has a minimum. But when you look at it from the side, you see that there's a dent in here. Do you see the dent? So there is a preferred region. However, there are lots of logarithms and determinants running around. That's why it's so badly scaled. What about turning it around a little bit like that? Yeah, I'm not sure whether I see a dent then there as well. Let's use this other function. Let's optimize it with the mouse, okay? So here I can go with the mouse, and if the number gets smaller, I follow that direction. So smaller, 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 uh, maybe larger. Oh, larger, oh, even smaller. I think this is almost the minimum here, the nine, mi minus 9.59. So that is the minimum of this function. And I think if I go further here, it's increasing again. So there is a minimum in here. And I didn't put the right axis on here, but it is something close to the true parameters here. Okay, they are, so the, uh, we are estimating the tau square and the sigma square, and it looks like we are really are able to identify it. Without splitting, just taking the full training data set and being Bayesian for the parameter, and then maximum likelihood for the hyperparameter. Okay, so this is quite nice. Um, unfortunately, numerically, it's not nice because let's see what's, how it goes on now. So I calculated here these values and they kind of make sense, kind of. Let's implement the derivative of the log marginal likelihood. So this is now this monster formula that we've seen here. So I implemented those, yeah? And you can just read them off, really. So there is this big matrix. Um, we need the inverse of A very often and I did it in a stupid way, just call it b, and then I introduce a new variable b, y, y, b, bring your something, I don't know what acronym this is, but it's this expression. And that is the expression that appears over here, right? And it, once I'm calculating just a trace of it, and then I'm first multiplying it with x, x transpose, and then calculating the trace, okay? So that's why I give it a name. So gradient zero for the sigma squared is just a trace of this matrix, and the gradient one is the trace of this matrix multiplied with some other matrices. And there I was really super curious whether this is really the derivative, right? How do you check it? You use finite differencing, of course, right? So here's our finite differencing code from last time. 
And then I'm comparing it, and I was super surprised. It turns out it really works, right? I mean, the formulas here, they look really bad, and they look really, yeah. A priori, I would think they are too complicated to be the right solution. But as it turns out, the finite differencing says, this is the solution. So OK, then I thought, great. Um, then let's do, imp let's do gradient descent on these um, gradients now when I have them. So I did a simple implementation of it where you give a learning rate and you give an f function and a gradient for the f. And you just do these updates, x equals x minus learning rate times gradient of f. OK? And then in between, you print out the optimization. And uh, this is just a little demo for some squared function to check that everything works, OK? And it works. So this thing is really minimizing a function. Let's apply gradient descent now to the marginal likelihood, OK? So um, where do we have it? Oh, yeah. For this now, I just plug in the log marginal likelihood function, and I plug in the gradient that I implemented of the log marginal likelihood function and some starting point. And when I do it, it is nicely minimizing the whole thing. However, it is not reaching the minus 9 point something that I was reaching by hand. I think the reason is, in that area, it's kind of super flat. And if I have the wrong learning rate, it's kind of jumping around and jumping out of this spot. So somehow, it's a nonlinear optimization problem here that I couldn't solve. But I'm sure someone can solve it, maybe with the quasi-Newton method or with some other tricks or something. And then, in principle, you could estimate that, OK? Good. So it can be implemented somehow. Matrix differential calculus is super cool because you can do these things here. Um, again, let's flip back to the overview. So that was the overview. And um, it, the lecture was on model selection. And we first looked at the classical machine learning model selection type of thing, which is splitting your data into data you use and data that is artificially unseen, where you, where you don't look at. And this idea of splitting the data set can be done on several levels. You can use it to estimate the mean squared error, to do good model selection for your hyperparameters, d. But then later on, you can also use this splitting on a higher level to do an estimation of your real mean squared error of your methods that at the end comes out of your, um, out of your work. OK? Then there's the other world, the Bayesian model selection world. And that is completely independent of this idea of splitting a data set in seen and unseen data. However, surprisingly, it allows also to find good hyperparameters, but with a completely different approach. Numerically challenging, at least for me, right? I couldn't get it to run. But in principle, looking at the graph, it looks like it works. OK? And the big advantage of the Bayesian model selection is you use all the data for the estimation. The big disadvantage is it's numerically unstable in my hands. And also, um, you need additional assumption. You need this additional prior and this kind of stuff. And um, you need to solve integrals that we cannot solve yet. OK, so that is a quick summary. Question. Yeah. Ah, again, very, that's, it's basically you translate it. OK, the question is, how do we get now for unknown data? How can we use it for prediction, right? Yes. And um, this is exactly the question that you asked also for the machine learning one. But now apply to the, that's very nice. Um, this was just about model selection, how to choose the hyperparameters. Once you've chosen the hyperparameters, you can plug them in and you do level one Bayesian inference for the W. So you, this is just a procedure to find the hyperparameters. And then you plug them in and do the usual Bayesian inference for the Bayesian linear regression. So after this, you say they are now constant and fixed. Of course, in a perfect world, we would derive the posterior distribution of the hyperparameters. And then we would not only integrate out the w, we would also integrate out the hyperparameter and have a posterior predictive distribution. However, that's infeasible. Or maybe it can be done with MCMC or something in some toy problems, but that's like an, it's unclear to me how to do it in practice. 
but it's a good point. So this model selection is really about choosing among hyperparameters or choosing between different models. It's the same ideas. Any more questions? If not, then thanks for your attention, and I see you again on Monday.